I don't know why this meter is just now in effect or how it got here in the first place, but you know what, it's fine. Okay, how'd I do? I was definitely getting a little anxious there, you know what I mean? Oh no. You know what I mean? Okay, according to my readings, the entire Earth is now Liam Gallagher's head. Oh, this is a total disaster, but I think I know how to fix it. On today's episode of the Deep Discog Dive, we're gonna be talking about the other kings of 90s Britpop, Blur. Two childhood friends, Damon Albarn and Graham Coxton, would form the backbone of a Britpop foursome that would rock the UK at approximately the same time that Oasis was also rocking the UK. The rivalry between the two bands was the subject of many a tabloid headline, but they both managed to put out genre-defying albums, eight in Blur's case. With the benefit of time, we might even be able to see who were the true victors of the Britpop battle. Let's dive in. So this is how Blur started out, by making very adequate shoegaze. Hmm. Ah, this is more like it. Far grander in scope with a much greater diversity of instrumentation, all layered with some good old fashioned British working class cynicism. This is the jaded version of the kinks that I never knew I wanted. Okay, take everything I just said about modern life and pretend that I yelled it, because Park Life is just more of everything that made that album a fulfilling listen. Also, it's so rare for me as an American to hear pop or rock music that is so firmly ingrained in a culture that's not my own. Phil Daniels talking about Brewer's Droop and Gut Lord's Marching just... You know what I mean? <laughs> okay, what I said about the last two records, but like whispered, because this last installment of what's considered to be their life trilogy has all of the elements that made those past two records good, but not much else new that makes it more engaging or fulfilling. Except the Universal. That's, that's a good song. That's a good boy. Ah yes, the band's pivot to a more typical alt-rock sound, including the song that was allegedly written to be a goof intended for Americans like me. You think this is gonna work on me, Damon? You think, you think I'm just gonna fall for this? Well, guess what? Yeah, I did, I, I liked it. Without a doubt, this record had the most troubled development out of all of Blur's albums. Tensions between the band members were at their highest, they were working with a new producer for the first time since Modern Life, and Damon Albarn was not only coping with a high-profile breakup, but also with a drug addiction. All of this meant that this had the potential to be the band's Be Here Now, but... Christ, this is phenomenal. I, I feel bad for saying this because of what they had to go through to make it, but this is probably my favorite album of theirs. There are definitely some transitional pains, what with Graham Coxton leaving the band right after recording began, but even still, Damon Albarn's first solo album is quite worth the list. This is a Blur album? Really? I mean, I, I still like it, but wow, okay. New word, out of my after Think Tank, the band decided to keep a low profile. Uh, there were some plans to try to get together and make music that were ultimately canned, uh, some rumors that they were trying to bring in a new guitarist to replace Graham, uh, but ultimately no new music from them as a group. That said, they did keep busy as individuals. Uh, Graham has a couple of solo albums, Alex James did some producing and songwriting work, Dave Roundtree became a solicitor and politician. Though most surprisingly, Damon Albarn didn't release any new music. That's right, he essentially disappeared from the public eye and he didn't make music with anyone. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna play a bass line that I just thought of and no one has ever heard before. Feel good. I just thought of that too. Okay, fine, he was obscenely prolific. Rocket to the Moon, The Good, The Bad, and The Queen, contributions to the likes of De La Soul, Vince Staples, the late Bobby Womack. He's written operas for crying out loud. And of course, gorillas, who will probably get their own dive at some point in the future. But in 2009, they decided to reunite to play Hyde Park, which went over so well that they decided to play a few other big shows, which leads us to... Like many reunion albums after so many years apart, this had all the potential to suck, but surprise, surprise, it's, it's pretty good. It's another great example of the studio experimentation showcased in 13 and Think Tank, just more refined considering how long these guys have been in the game. Also, Ghost Ship is a total bop. 
coming in there. Look, I know I've sounded like a broken record, but I genuinely don't think Blur have a bad album in them. At worst, they're just fairly okay. Their early work showed that they were capable of delivering killer hooks, along with topical lyrical themes about middle-class life in Britain. And their later work maintained that musicianship while letting the studio become an instrument in the process. So I guess we should try to decide then, who won the Britpop Wars? Well, to me, Oasis was more capable of delivering immediately gripping hooks with bombastic production, so I think their work was easier to get into on first listen. On the other hand, though, Blur showcased a greater ability to adapt and experiment, which I think made them more successful in the long run. To put it simply, Oasis may have won the Britpop battle, but Blur, and more specifically Damon Albarn, won the Britpop war. If you want to get into Blur's discography, I highly recommend checking out these two albums, and then these two if you want to dive in a bit deeper. And with all that done, I think that means that the world's about to go back to normal. Ah, oh, good. The universe is back in balance. I just hope there are no long-standing consequences for doing any of this stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah.